Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the December 4th seminar that is happening today at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on December 6th, 2023. Uh, the title of uh, the topics that, or the sort of the theme around the topics that we're going to discuss today are addressing the present danger invasive species pose to Canada's forest biodiversity. And we have four, we have five speakers, four presentations that will discuss this on various aspects. But first, I'd like to uh, introduce the, uh, the sponsors of this seminar. Uh, first, I'd like to have a few words from Jim McCready, who's representing the Eastern Ontario Model Forest. He is the chair of the Forest Health Network of the Eastern Ontario Model Forest. And good morning, Jim. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, this uh, seminars have been going on since 1978, and they're first brought to to you by Ministry of Natural Resources, then uh, uh, Eastern Ontario Model Forest and uh, Canadian Institute of Forestry Ottawa chapter took over these sessions, and uh, they come up with a theme every year. This year's theme uh, was, uh, uh, like Joseph said, was to do with invasive species. And what we have under the umbrella of the Eastern Ontario Model Forest is the Regional Forest Health Network that uh, looks after the area of Eastern Ontario, Western Quebec, and Northern New York State. And it was very easy for them to talk to me and uh, the partners in uh, the Forest Health Network stepped up uh, to meet the, the challenge. And the network is made up of 27 partners, including Nakwasasne governments, cities like the city of Ottawa and what have you. And the theme today, uh, we put together on invasive species. And one of the things that was brought up as well, what's happening in New York state. And they are, partners and acquaintances with us now uh, in Northern New York State. And so we have Robert from St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario Partnership for uh, uh, the Regional uh, Invasive Species Management. And he's going to be talking, what do they have south of the uh, south of the border that's coming our way? So again, I would like to thank you for joining us. Uh, with the Eastern Ontario Model Forest, Ontario Woodlot Association, and CIF for this presentation we're going to be giving you today on invasive species. Hey, thank you, Jim. And the other organization that is part of the sponsoring group is the Canadian Institute of Forestry, Canadian Institute of Forestry Ottawa Valley Section. And I'd like to introduce Ken Farr, who is also one of our presenters, but will first off give us a few words of welcome and a little bit of information about CIF. Ken. Well, thank, thanks, Joe. Thanks very much. And thanks everyone for joining in today. Uh, just a little background on the Canadian Institute of Forestry, the Institut Forestier du Canada. Uh, it's a not for profit member based organization, and it was founded in 1908 and is the oldest forestry society in Canada, serving as the voice of forest practitioners, representing foresters, forest technologists, technicians, ecologists, biologists, educators, and any others with an interest in forest and forestry. So, as the chair of the Ottawa Valley section of the CIF IFC, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's forest research seminar, and I'd like to stand and an invitation to those watching here in the Utahways region to consider becoming a member of the Ottawa Valley section of the Canadian Institute of Forestry. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Ken. Uh, and we'll hear more from Ken in a, in a few minutes. And finally, but not least, uh, the, uh, the Ontario Woodlot Association, and we have John Pino, who's the executive director. Please, John, could you give us a few words of welcome? Thanks, Joe. It's uh, it's always great to attend these webinars, and every year the uh, the presentations seem to get better and better, and that's a, a tough thing to do. But yeah, I'm the executive director of both the Ontario Woodlot Association and the Eastern Ontario Model Forest. We're kind of joined at the hip now, and uh, Jim gave a great introduction on the the model forest. But uh, we now share governance and staff, and uh, we're all about. You know, making sure that uh, we can be the best possible stewards of our privately owned forest 
and we apply uh, best force management practices that uh, you know help with the uh, the ecological integrity and maintenance and and biodiversity wildlife habitat and and economic benefit. So we're we're just all about helping our members, about three thousand of them across Ontario, to be really excellent stewards. I know a lot of our members are are tuned in today. If you're uh, if you're not a member, we'd sure appreciate you considering joining, and uh, that that enables us to help have these platforms and and provide you know Zoom uh, Zoom webinar uh, licenses and and have our staff uh, coordinate a lot of the stuff behind the scenes, and we'd really appreciate that support. Or if you're not uh, so much into membership, a donation through the Model Force Charity, which we administer, or through the OWA's uh, Champion Donor Program is, is appreciated. We want to keep these these great events and this knowledge exchange happening. So thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, John. So without further ado, let's start the webinar. And it gives me great pleasure to talk about the uh, first uh, the first presentation and speaker, which is entitled Canada-Wide Context, the role of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in combating invasive species. So presenting this will be Thierry Poiré, who grew up in Quebec City. He is he studied bio uh, bioagronomy at Laval University with a specialization in plant protection entomology. He started working for the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in 2001 in Montreal as a plant health inspector. He moved to Ottawa in 2004 to work with the horticultural section of the Policy and Programs branch. In 2011, he transferred to the Plant Health Risk Assessment Unit to work on risk assessments of exotic invasive plant pests, insects. In 2018, he started his current position as a survey biologist in the Plant Health Survey Unit, which plans and coordinates Canadian Food Inspection Agency's National Plant Health so Surveys. So please join me in welcoming uh, Thierry Poiré. Good morning. Thanks for the introduction. I will um, try to share my screen. Let's see how that goes. Is this, uh, is this good to go? We're good, awesome. All right, so um, as uh, it's been said, I'm a part of the, uh, the Plant Health Surveillance Unit, um, which is a team of uh, seven uh, survey biologists um, in addition to my current manager, which is uh, Aaron Bolas appleton uh, who some of you may know. Um, I have other five other colleagues uh, that are assigned like uh, an area in the country. So I've got a colleague in the Atlantic. I've got a colleague in Quebec, one in Ontario, who is currently uh, Nicole Milev Milevchek. And I also have two colleagues in the West. Uh, covering the BC uh, province and and uh, and the prairies, um, my role in the unit is really uh, more national in scope. So I support the whole team. I don't have a specific area to take care of. Uh, I support the whole team. I do uh, data management, uh, mapping, annual report, um, amongst amongst other things. Um, so that means I might not be aware of all the details uh, regarding specific find or specific action in the field, but um, if I have questions I'm not able to answer, I'll be more than happy to uh, talk to my colleague and get back to, get back to you with, uh, with an answer. All right. So just a quick overview of my talk, uh, which will be mostly devoted to 2023 results, um, and also a quick look at the uh, at emerging pest that we have, uh, we have on our radar. Um, for those who are not familiar with the CFIA, um, well, we do food safety, of course, and animal health, uh, but, but CFIA is also the, the organization responsible for the regulation of exotic invasive plant pests. So that includes uh, plant as pests, so weeds, but also uh, insects, uh, microorganisms, diseases, mollusks, uh, and everything. So. 
uh, lots, there's lots to cover. Um, our surveillance program covers uh, pests affecting many different sectors of the Canadian economy and the environment. Uh, so forestry, horticulture, potatoes, uh, grains, and, uh, and oil seed. Um, for today's talk, we're going to focus, of course, on the forestry uh, program, so, uh, which helps support the, the importation and exportation of forestry products. Uh, while preventing, of course, the introduction and spread of the of regulated pests in Canada. Um, when we conduct uh, our surveys um, for forest pests, uh, it helps support the regulatory decisions uh, for e import, export, and, and any domestic movement of, of forestry product. So because... Uh, Canada is a big country. Uh, we cannot survey everywhere. Um, we also cannot survey for every plant pest out there. So we need a way to identify uh, to identify emerging threats and to identify high risk areas where we need to survey. So, uh, so to do this, we need to gather as much information as possible. So, like this, this title, integrating risk intelligence, really means gathering. Uh, information about pests and, and and risks as a whole. And we try to do that from as many uh, various sources as possible to make the best assessment that we can. Um, one thing that has, uh, that that's really popular right now, I mean, online reporting platforms have really taken off in recent years, like they've exploded. <laughs> uh, platforms like iNaturalist and other uh, platforms. Um, uh, I mean, it, it, it's a great way for people to report what they see out there. And they definitely had an impact on our capability of gathering information, uh, which is out there like the plant health group and CFIA is not that big. So we need all we need all these these eyes out there to um, to capture what they see and report them on those online platforms. So for us, it's a great way to to broaden our our uh, surveillance of what's happening in this big country, um, so we have more tools to connect with partners and 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 the public around around the country and around the world as well. So we we, we literally have millions of eyes out there that we can now tap into. So which is uh, uh, really uh, good for us. Um, more specifically for us at the CFIA, um, there's been a big change in the way we gather information about uh, our surveys in the, in the field. So um, we now have a, a, an electronic platform. So inspectors are were given um, smartphones. And with the help of the survey 123 applic application from the, uh, the GIS company ESRI, uh, we now have a way for inspectors to capture all the information related to a survey right into the field. And, and if they have a cell phone connection, then they can we can uh, see in real time the progress of, of inspection. So for us, it's really been like a, a step into the 21st century in terms of how we capture our, uh, our survey data. Um, this data can be quickly analyzed, uh, could be quickly put on a map, and uh, it's been a great way for us to to keep an eye on what's happening in real time uh, when we conduct our surveys. This is quite an old uh, a change from our old way where inspectors had to uh, capture all the information about a, a survey site on a piece of paper and bring it back to the office uh, and add it to the stack. Uh, of paper and and wait until the end of the season to to capture that into a, a spreadsheet on a computer. So it's it's really uh, been a great way for us to improve our the way we conduct our surveys. So, so if we can can move now into like specific uh, survey results for twenty twenty three, and our first one is probably the uh, the broad one where we look at different. Um, at a whole a whole a range of, of uh, forestry pests. So uh, this is where we don't have a specific pest in mind. We just have a uh, um, uh, an open uh, survey where we 
put on put up um, uh, traps uh, that are baited with pheromones, and we look at what could be out there. Uh, so we look at different types of of, of um, wood boring beetles, um, so longhorn beetles or bark beetles, and we see what could be out there, what could be the uh, potential threat uh, coming into the country. So those traps are placed in uh, high risk areas, uh, which are associated with wood packaging and wood donage, import, um, importation of logs. Um, landfill and, and disposal sites and, and things like this. So we have identified those high-risk areas in the country and we've placed uh, those traps at those locations. Um, so for 2023, this is what the, the map can um, uh, looks like. Uh, we've had uh, 84 sites, um, high-risk sites that, uh, that were surveyed this year. Um, and um, lab analysis and, and identification of what we captured is not complete, but so far we haven't detected anything of concern to us, so which is a good news, but the like lab analysis and lab work is still ongoing. Um, one that's always very high on our list, um, the Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, this is a survey that we conduct every year in in all provinces. Usually, um, it was um, it was the case this year again. Of course, the Asian longhorn beetle is a is a serious pest of maple and other broadleaf trees. Um, we had an infestation in Toronto uh, in two thousand and three and two thousand thirteen as well, but it's now eradicated. Uh, but like the threat is still there, and we still need to continue the monitoring. Uh, to make sure that Canada is free from uh, this pest, uh, it is an, it is a, a, a pest native from from Asia, so uh, Japan, uh, Korea, and China, um, and it's known to attack uh, healthy and uh, healthy and to kill uh, hardwood trees. So it's really a, a worrying pest for us. Um, this survey is carried out in uh, winter months. Um, so when the trees are dormant and we see the, the bark and the branches and the leaves are on the ground. Uh, so uh, the results that uh, you see now on this map it, is really the survey that was conducted last winter. Um, we are starting the, the new survey right now. And now that the winter is, is, uh, is here, um, our inspectors will start this survey um, pretty soon now. And we need to keep continue. We need to keep uh, this uh, doing this survey to maintain the pest-free status of Canada. So we have about uh, I think eight hundred sites that were completed in Ontario last year. Of course, we keep uh, surveying around Toronto, which is a high-risk area for the introduction of this pest, as uh, as the uh, infestation in the past has proven. Uh, for this year, we are um, targeting um, the Kitchener, Waterloo, London, Kingston, Ottawa, and, and several areas in the GTA or the Grand Toronto area. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so uh, we, we do these surveys um, in the five year rotation. So when we have um, identify those high risk areas, so we keep going back at these uh, at these same cities, um, and we do a rotation. So every five years, the city is going to be um, surveyed again to make sure that there's been no introduction since the last survey. Now moving on to oak wilt, um, which unfortunately has been detected in uh, in Canada for the first time. Uh, we had three different uh, detections this year in Ontario. Um, of course, we were kind of expecting eventually that it would show up, but it's, it's still very disappointing when it happens. Um, so oak wilt uh, is caused by a, a fungus and, and uh, red oaks are particularly um, susceptible uh, it can result in the death of the tree uh, within a single season. Um, so our survey 
Our surveys are carried out in high-risk areas always, uh, close to the U.S. infested areas, but also where um, logs um, are important because we know this is a pathway. Uh, also at campgrounds where firewood is often brought. Um, <clears throat> we've had a lot of reports in 2023. Uh, many of them were related to the late frost that uh, affected oaks. So we had a lot of people reporting damage to oaks, but turned out to be the late frost that we had, at least in some part of the country. Um, but unfortunately, uh, it's, we've had uh, detection in, uh, in three areas. Um, it's always a challenge for the detection of oak wheel because uh, we need um, branch sampling. So we need a sample of, of branch to be able to confirm, or um, we need to see the damage on the trunk. Um, so um, we cannot take a leaf sample to detect. Uh, and confirm the uh, the oak wilt is present. So we need to take branch sample, uh, which which is an issue from a survey point of view. Um, so um, so this is the map uh, of the survey in twenty twenty three. So you see a few positives there in Ontario. So we had the uh, township of Spring Water. Uh, where oak wilt was detected at the residential property. Um, also in Niagara Falls and uh, Niagara on the lake. So we had three different sites. Um, after the uh, detections, we created an incident comment structure to coordinate the response with the, the partners. Um, so we also uh, surveyed all oak trees that were within 400 meters of the detections. Uh, and in some cases, we went beyond that that distance. Um, we had some uh, removals. So like in the Niagara Falls, like the infected oaks were uh, removed and were disposed of in uh, in June. Um, and in spring water as well, uh, the infected tree was removed in November. And uh, we're still waiting for the disposal of the tree in, in Niagara on the lake. And of course, that means that uh, we will increase significantly the um, the activity and the surveillance in the in in these areas uh, next year. So there will be an increase uh, in surveillance uh, to make sure that we are able to delimit the infestation and then we are able to contain the infestation as much as possible. Now moving on to uh, MLUC Woolly Adelgid, which is another big one on our radar always. Um, so the survey for this uh, can be done um, from during most of the year. Um, and and um, the visual, we do a visual survey, so which is also a challenge because usually MLUCs are, are big trees. <laughs> um, and, but they can, the visual surveys can be enhanced uh, with other methods, methods like a uh, Velcro ball. So we have a ball with Velcro on it and we can shoot it up in the canopy. And uh, we are sometimes able to uh, to grab a few of these, uh, um, uh, this, this pest and we can inspect the ball after that. And we are able to see if, if uh, MLUC will indulge it is present or not. But sometimes we also have to do climbing. So we, if we have a suspicious tree, uh, a climber can uh, go up in the tree to confirm or not um, if if the tree is infected. Um, we've had some unfortunate detection again. Um, so in Nova Scotia, in this case, we've had two detections outside of the regulated area that you see in yellow here. Um, so we always had a, a significant infest, uh, um, in, uh, infestation uh, in Nova Scotia. And unfortunately, we've had two more detections just uh, east of the current regulated area. For Ontario, we also had like a few more detections. Um, so if you see on this map here, um, you see those red circles 
um, which were previous detections, and the, the red the red squares are the new detections. Um, so all sites have been um, identified and they were managed with notices of prohibition of movement to contain the infestation, and uh, and 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 we will establish a strategy for next year. Um, so these detections suggest that HWA is establishing quite rapidly in Southern Ontario, uh, or they have a, a wider uh, distribution than initially thought. And, and unfortunately, yeah, MLOC with the Delgid is probably here to stay. Uh, so we need a, a broader approach to deal with, with this pest. Uh, so we need to, to look at collaboration with partners, and this is a key one, uh, but also outreach and, and education, looking at different ways to control uh, any infestation. Um, surveillance, of course, is key uh, to detect new infestations, uh, but we're also looking at the biocontrols um, and, and other type of controls where we could uh, try to limit the spread of, of this pest. Uh, moving on to our older friend, our, our old fiend, I should say, um, which continues to spread in some areas. Uh, so you have the map here. Um, <clears throat> in Ontario, we've had uh, one detection uh, just outside of the regulated uh, area in Tonda Bay. Um, we've had a few more detections in Quebec, unfortunately. Uh, so in the Western uh, province and, and also in Gaspésie, so close to New Brunswick, we've had two detections there. Um, and, and so these uh, uh, will probably be added to the regulated area next year. Uh, for Manitoba, we don't have uh, any movement on that side, so it seems to be pretty stable. We did find uh, two adults in um, in Winnipeg, uh, but they're still within the um, uh, the regulated area. So there's no not been an expansion of the infestation in Win in the Winnipeg area. A very strange detection this year is that we've had a detection in Vancouver, um, which is a little strange, uh, very far from any known previous infestation. Uh, person was standing in a park or was reading on the, in a park and, and an adult a, a B fell on his book, I think, or on his computer, and it was identified as the AAB. Uh, and we did some survey in the area and we could not detect any infested trees. So uh, we'll, we'll go back next year and, and try to find where this beetle came from. But so far we had this only detection of an adult so it's it's not considered like as an infestation. It's really just a detection. So we need to investigate this next year. <clears throat> so um, as I mentioned, some new uh, MRCs or uh, area counties in Quebec will be added uh, to the regulated area next year, um, and there will be status quo for the for the rest of the of the country. Um, and we'll follow up, of course, on, on the situation in Vancouver to see what's happening there. Um, in 2024, we will also have a, a look, uh, our, our program and policy uh, colleagues will have a look at the long-term management of EAB in Eastern Canada. Um, so like EAB is spreading now to most areas where ash trees are found. So I think we will have to start looking at the uh, management plan on, in the long term um, for EAB. Um, so this will probably happen next year. Quick word on brown spruce longhorn beetle. Um, so this one has, this survey has yielded some new finds in, in 2023. Uh, a surprise, a surprising detection in southern Quebec 
in the bows area. Um, so we've had a detection in in, uh, in a trap that was placed in that area, but we don't have any infested trees yet. Of course, we will increase our surveillance in that area next year. Um, but like it's very far from any known infestation, which is in Memram Cook in, in New Brunswick. So we're not too too sure what's happening there, but like we suspect that there's been some um forestry products that were imported into Quebec uh from an infested area. Um so we will definitely increase our surveillance in this uh area next year to see what's happening. And there's also been another detection in uh in Frederick in Fredericton, I'm sorry, in New Brunswick. Uh so we've had the detection in the past a number of years ago, uh, followed by multiple years of negative results. Uh and in this year, uh we've had a detection in the trap as well. So uh there will be an increased surveillance next year. Quick word on the Spongy mud, which is continues to be a big a major survey for CFIA. Um, like Eastern Canada is being uh, is now mostly regulated, as you can see on this map. Um, we continue to have like a pretty high level of of, of detections in in Western Canada. Um, we think that it's really mostly uh, egg masses that are being moved uh, to Western Canada because the eastern canada has had a a, a serious uh, peak uh, a level uh, of infestation and population in recent years so we think that it's probably still related to the uh, to uh, an explosion of the population in eastern canada and uh, those resulted in egg masses being moved to the eastern uh, provinces and, uh, there's no infestation that's been um uh, detected like we don't find infected trees infested trees and we only find uh, adult moths uh, in traps so we don't treat them as as uh, an established population in ontario uh, we keep uh, doing some surveillance uh, outside the regulated areas um, so um, we continue to do a molecular analysis for spongy mud um, to make sure that the uh, we don't have the Asian strain of spongy mud. So, um, so we have like lab uh, doing analysis on uh, captured uh, moth to make sure that this is still the European strain and not the Asian strain. <clears throat> a quick word on the uh, um, zigzag sawfly. Uh, like CFI don't doesn't have any regulatory measures in place for this insect, but we acknowledge that uh, there's been many report, reports in 2023 of increased damage uh, and sometimes severe defoliation to elm trees uh, in 2023. So there's been definitely a, a growth in the population of the uh, sawfly. Um, like this, this sawfly was detected in, in 2020, and you can see on this map, uh, this is pulled from the iNaturalist platform that, uh, the spread has been very rapid as we expected. Um, this insect is a protonogenic, uh, insect. So it means that it can reproduce without males. Uh, so only females are known in this, in this pest, so they can, uh, reproduce multiple generations. Uh, they can have multiple generations per year, and they're very strong flyers. So we know that they can spread uh, easily and they can reproduce in vast numbers. So we kind of expected a, a rapid spread of this of this pest. Um, so we, we'll keep an eye on this one, but for the now, for the time being, um, this pest is not is not uh, the object of any regulatory measures by the CFIA. Okay, thanks, Titi. I you probably have a few more to go through, but if we were to keep the time and yeah. just answer one or two questions, maybe 
we'll we'll flip to those and people will have access to these slides afterwards. Is that okay? Sure, sure thing. Okay, just to, so we keep on, we actually, we have sort of five questions, but um, let's uh, try to, uh, I'll, I'll go with the first one. And if we have time at the end, we might try to address the other ones, but one sure. of the one of the people's talk. One of the questions. One of the questions is uh, that uh, Canada seems to be a melting pot of invasive species. Has Canada been responsible? Has Canada been responsible for introducing any new in introducing invasive species to other countries? Um, it's it's always uh, it's always uh, difficult to pinpoint the exact. Uh, location or the exact origin of a pest where when it's un introduced. Sometimes we know exactly what happened, but most of the times we know the areas at risk and we know in general where commodities come from, but it's really difficult to pinpoint exactly the origin of a pest uh, when a new detection is done. So I'm sure that there's been some pest that has moved to the southern water um, from our country uh, like we've had recent detections of uh, of uh, box tree moths in the u.s and this this insect was detected in canada first so one could <laughs> conclude that uh, that some pests can move south as well um, and not only in the country thank you so we'll move on to our next presentation uh it's going to talk about the, the canada wide context sort of two, protecting Canada's lands and waters from invasive species. And we have two speakers from the Invasive Species Center. I'd like to I'd like to welcome, um, and as I move on to their, Madison Sturba. Madison is Program Development Coordinator, uh, Program Development Coordinator at the Invasive Species Center, where she focuses on training and outreach, particularly on forest and agricultural pests. She, gradu she graduated from the University of Windsor with an MSc in biology and an honors bachelor in bachelor's in behavioral and cognition and neurosciences. Joining Madison is Liana Peronowitz, and hopefully I got her last name proper. Liana is the aquatic program coordinator for, with the Invasive Species Center, where she works with the team to produce a suite of outcomes that strive to address key gaps in invasive species prevention, control, and management. Her primary role is coordinating work in aquatic invasive species pre prevention. Leanna has an, has an undergraduate degree in biology from Algoma University. Please join me in welcoming Madison and Leanna. Thanks so much, Joseph. Thanks for having us. I um, just wanna make sure you can see our slides okay. I'll assume yes. <laughs> um, yes, so I can see the slides. Oh, okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, so just in case you didn't know about us or you're not familiar with the Invasive Species Center, we're a not-for-profit organization based out of Sault Ste. Marie that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. So I'll start us off with some forest pest updates before Leanna dives into the aquatic species. So I'll cover three priority species that we've been following pretty closely at the Invasive Species Center, the first being oak wilts. So oak wilt is an invasive vascular disease of oak trees caused by the non-native fungus Brettsilia fagocerum. The fungus will spread throughout the xylem, which prevents water and nutrients from moving up from the roots. Um, so the leaves can wilt and drop without these resources, which is where the name comes from. Um, you can see an infected leaf there um, from a tree infected with oak wilt. So the bronzing typically starts at the outer edges of the leaf and then moves inwards. All oaks can become infected with oak wilt, but red oaks are particularly vulnerable and can die in a single season. I've heard sometimes as, much, as early as like two to four weeks, so pretty quickly. Um, these two trunk pictures here were actually taken of an infected tree in the city of Niagara Falls. So a homeowner called a local arborist to remove three dead red oaks on their property. And when the arborist arrived to the house, this is what they saw. Um, so the tree was completely dead and defoliated in the middle of summer, which is already a sign that something's wrong. Um, and then when they were looking at the tree further, the arborist noticed these long vertical bark cracks, which is a major red flag for oak wilt. So the arborist made a report to the city and to the CFIA right away. And when folks came out to inspect the site some more, they pulled back the bark to find these fungal mats and pressure pads. So in red oaks, the oak, um, so in red oaks infected with oak wilt, um, the fungus will spread throughout the tree. And once it's dead, it'll concentrate in these large spots underneath the bark and start producing spores. 
So it'll form these pressure pads, which push up against the bark, and it'll eventually create enough pressure to crack the bark, which helps release the sweet smell of the fungus and attract beetles to help spread the disease. So this is the fungal mat here, this big area, and then the pressure pads are these little raised areas in the middle. And this tree had quite a bit. So you can see this one here, the edges of another one, and the tip of a third one. So it was um, pretty infected. Oak wilt has been found in 24 US states, several of which border Ontario. Um, you can see all the different counties in yellow that have been impacted by oak wilt. So it's become quite widespread there. The closest detection was on Belle Isle, Michigan, which is within 500 meter of Windsor, Ontario. So because of this detection and others throughout Michigan, we thought Windsor would be the first place of introduction into Canada, but it was actually the city of Niagara Falls. Um, so like we heard, it was detected in Niagara in May, 2023. So this year for the first time, it was then confirmed a little later in the township of Springwater near Barrie and then the town of Niagara on the lake. Um, so we can look at the CFA map um, to see the Ontario detections a little more clearly. I know we already saw this here, but um, it really shows how much work's being done. So um, all of the red triangles are where the detections have occurred this year, and then all of the green ones are the survey sites throughout Ontario. So the CFA completed visual surveys at 60 planned sites in Ontario. They also completed surveys at about 500 additional properties in response to the detections and followed up on over 450 reports from the public. So there's been a lot of work going into monitoring oak wilt. So the arrival of oak wilt has really triggered a large collaborative response. When the CFA received the first report of oak wilt, they immediately called an oak wilt technical advisory committee meeting to discuss next steps. So this group was created a really long time ago in preparation for oak wilt, and it's a group made of federal, provincial, and municipal governments, as well as other partners like the Invasive Species Center to really discuss collaborative response options. So the CFA and the state of Niagara Falls worked together to develop a management plan to remove and dispose of the infested trees immediately. Um, so the site in Niagara Falls, they removed three dead red oaks over the course of two days. So they moved really quickly to cut down all those trees to remove them from the backyard. So you can see in this picture here, they used a crane. So it was a, a lot of work to do that. Um, they had to transport all that material off site and they had to bury it all as well. Um, but in the end, they did successfully remove all the infected trees from the site. Oak wilt is a naturally slow moving disease. So eradication is definitely possible when acting fast. So it's important to remove the trees at the site, but it's also important to ramp up outreach and training to get people out looking for oak wilt, which is super important for early detection. So our role at the ISE was to really act as a hub of information and resources. We did this in a lot of different ways, like by hosting webinars, updating fact sheets, providing training and giving interviews to different news stations across the province, just to really spread the word. In terms of next steps, there's a lot going on uh, for monitoring oak wilt. The state of Niagara Falls was done extensive surveying, as has the CFA, and all the results have come up negative. So there haven't been any other cases of oak wilt found. So the second forest pass we've been keeping an eye on is hemlock woolly adelgid. Hemlock woolly adelgid is a tiny aphid-like insect that sucks the sap of hemlock trees, killing them in four to 15 years, depending on the health of the tree prior. The insects themselves are super tiny and really difficult to see without some sort of magnification. Um, so the easiest way to find them is to look for their ovisacs. So they create these white wool-like ovisacs as they grow, which kind of resembles little cotton balls or clumps of snow. You'll only ever really see these white ovisacs at the base of the needles on the underside of branches where they like to feed. So if you're going, like walking through a hemlock stand, just flip over branches as you go to see if there's any signs of hemlock woolly adelgid. So you can see it here. These are, this is a really early infestation. The twigs look pretty good, except for a few tiny little ovisacs here or there. And this is a later one where they're just all around at the base of the needles there. This is a map of the insect in North America that was made by the USDA. So they're showing the detections made in and before 2022 in that dark burgundy and yellow. And then I added in the 2023 Ontario detections in bright red. Um, so all of the green is the range of hemlock. So we can see here that hemlock woolly adelgid has spread almost throughout the entire range of hemlock in the States has become pretty widespread. Um, and then in Canada, like we heard, it's been found in Nova Scotia and Ontario. So let's zoom in on the Ontario detections in particular. I tried to show a little timeline of where it's been found uh, in the past. So from 2013 until 2021, it's been relatively isolated in the Niagara region. But 2022, so last year is when things started to get a little more concerning because that's when it popped up on the North shore of Lake Ontario near Coburg, which is pretty far away from all the other detections. One of the ways this insect spreads is on birds. So the crawlers can crawl onto the birds or the ovisacs can stick to their feathers, kind of like Velcro. Um, 
So if that bird picks those up and then happens to fly off and land on another hemlock tree, it can introduce that uh, insect to a whole other area and start new infestations. So Niagara is a big stop oversight for migratory birds. So that's one uh, bigger concern. Um, but looking at the map again here, we see three new detections this year in 2023 in red. Um, but I really want to zone in on this one here in Haldeman County because this detection was actually found as a result of our new hemlock woolly adelgid monitoring network. So because of all the recent detections, it's become more and more important to develop additional tools that detect hemlock woolly adelgid more efficiently. Um, so one of the ways we're trying to do that is through a hemlock woolly adelgid monitoring network eDNA program, it's kind of a mouthful. Um, but this program was initiated last year to increase early detection of hemlock woolly adelgid outside of known distribution and regulated areas and it's run by the Invasive Species Center in partnership with Natural Resources Canada and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. So we piloted this eDNA program this past year to test the use of eDNA traps in hemlock woolly adelgid detection. Um, so these traps are a method developed by Dr. Sherilyn Partridge and Meg Sanders at Grand Valley State University. They created these 3D printed traps that hold four microscope slides. So that's what they look like here in orange and these are where the microscope slides go. Um, the slides are dipped in petroleum jelly, and the idea is that hemlock woolly adelgid insects themselves or the eDNA that's in the environment, so things like insect legs or wings, excrement, uh, wolf fragments, things like that, that are being dispersed by the wind or in debris will stick to this jelly. And then we can take the slides after they've been in the field for a long time, visually inspect them under a microscope at the ISC first, and then we send everything to our partners for further analysis in the lab. So this is what the actual setup looks like here. Um, in the picture on the right. So the discs sit on top of a pole um, and that's elevated off the ground and it's left there untouched for two months. Um, so you can see what comes in the package in this top picture here. So you get the, the disc and all information and protocols and things like that. Um, and then we tape up some signage on the pole as well. That way, if anyone comes across the, the whole setup and have questions, they can kind of read more to find out about the insect in the program. So this new tool has worked out quite well this year. Um, overall, compared to other monitoring methods, this eDNA trapping is less intensive since you can just set it up and leave it completely. It's relatively inexpensive. Um, there's also limited previous knowledge or expertise required. So really anybody can use this. Um, and it does give us access to areas that were difficult to survey in the past. So we sent these trapped out to 50 different volunteers this past year. We sent out a call for participants and had 80 people apply, but because of just the limited supplies with it being the first year of running it, we can only provide 50. We'll be running the program again next year and do plan to provide more traps, especially to those in high risk areas. So if you're interested in receiving a trap and taking part in our monitoring program, um, definitely check out our website. You can sign up there to receive updates on when registration opens. Um, just to kind of summarize the program here, um, it was successful overall because it did lead to that one positive detection in Haldeman County that may have otherwise gone unnoticed. Um, the report also made its way onto EdMaps and iNaturalist, so anyone can view it and check it out. The last pass I'll quickly talk about is spotted lanternfly. The spotted lanternfly is an invasive plant hopper that feeds on over 100 different plant hosts, including economically and plant important plants like grapevines and maple trees. So this is what spotted lanternfly looks like. Here you can see the eggs on the far left. left. These are the actual eggs up here, and then the females actually coat them in this waxy type of substance um, just to give them some protection. They kind of look like a smear of mud, which makes them a little more difficult to spot. They go through a few different nymph stages, but over time they'll go from these small black nymphs with white spots to slightly larger, brighter red nymphs. Um, and then you can see the adults on the right-hand side there. They're about an inch or inch and a half in length with these pinkish spotted wings. So um, spotted lanternfly nymphs and adults don't usually kill the plants, uh, but they can in the case of grapevines, um, but usually they'll seriously weaken the plants by feeding on the sugars in the plant's phloem. Uh, these insects also really like to congregate in big groups, so plants being attacked by spotted lanternfly are usually trying to deal with tons of feeding all at once. It's not just one little insect trying to feed. They can also be pretty gross too because they'll um, excrete a sticky honeydew substance as a waste product. And this honeydew will coat the host plants, kind of coat any underlying objects like sidewalks and can even fall down on people like rain. So spotted lanternfly has been found in 14 US states with the closest known detections being Buffalo, New York and Pontiac, Michigan. Thankfully it hasn't been confirmed in Canada yet, but there's been an increase in suspect sightings made by the public recently. So this picture on the right is one example of an interception where this adult got stuck under the plastic wrapping of a shipment coming into Canada. Thankfully, it wasn't released or anything like that, and the CFA were able to go out and inspect it. Um, 
but it really just shows how good these insects are at hitchhiking. Uh, they can, the adults can really hang on uh, and hitch rides on cargo or even on your vehicles. Um, so just wanted to note that the all the suspect reports have had extensive follow-up by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and they have yet to find any live individuals or populations. So um, again, SLF has not been confirmed in Canada. The last thing I will say here is that if you do find anything that looks like it could be spotted lanternfly, snap it, catch it, and report it. Um, it's really important to take pictures and note your location and actually capture the insect. It doesn't bite or sting, so it's perfectly safe to touch and collect in a bag. Um, the CFA just needs that specimen for confirmation and further inspection. So once you have it captured, definitely report it to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency immediately. Now I'll pass it over to Leanna now. Awesome. Thanks, Maddie. Um, so yeah, I'm going to quickly give an update on a couple aquatic invasive species and also some updates to the um, Invasive Species Act. So first, I'm going to give an update on grass carp. Um, grass carp is one of the four species of Asian carp that are threatening to invade the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. So um, grass carp we're most concerned about because it's the most immediate threat to the Canadian waters. And I'm going to start by saying that there's no established populations um, of grass carp yet. Um, meaning that there's no re reproducing populations. So um, grass carp have largely been um, throughout the U.S. due to um, stocking of um, for aquatic control. So basically, these fish have such large appetites, they can eat up to 40% of their body weight a day in aquatic weeds. Um, so they were stocked throughout the U.S. Um, due to their feeding habits. Um, here you can see a map of where certain states allow um, either fertile or sterile or no stocking at all. So in Canada, it's illegal to possess grass carp at all, um, along with all those states in red. Um, the yellow states allow sterile fish and the green states still allow fertile fish. So that's also a reason for some of the um, areas where grass carp have been found as well. So as I mentioned, there are four species of Asian carp. Um, big head and silver, you could see on, on the bottom of Lake Michigan there. They're in the Mississippi, but kind of stopped at uh, in the Chicago waterway system. There's an electric barrier that are stopping these fish from coming any closer um, into the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. Bl black carp are a little further down the Mississippi. Um, however, grass carp are established in a few U.S. tributaries of Lake Erie, making them a direct, a direct threat to the Canadian waters um, through those U.S. tributaries. So that's why most of our work is focused on grass carp prevention. Um, as mentioned, grass carp have huge eating habits. They can eat up to 40% of their body weight a day. However, they could only, or they only digest about half of that plant material, meaning they expel the rest back into the water, um, which could create toxic algal blooms and have um, detrimental effects to wetlands. They could also have um, serious impacts to native fish species, which would then impact commercial fishing and recreational fishing. Um, and there's also a whole lot of other social and economic impacts that these fish would cause as well. Um, as for early detection surveillance, um, DFO goes to surveillance sites each year. Um, they, do, they do early detection surveillance at up to 37 high rates locations throughout the Great Lakes each year um, to check for these fish. MNRF also conducts eDNA sampling to test for traces of these fish. Um, and as well as I mentioned, um, these fish are established in areas of the US. So American agencies are working um, and doing monitoring on the US side of the Great Lake. Um, since they are shared waters, it's a joint effort to prevent these fish from traveling any closer up into Canadian waters. Um, now I'm gonna give an update on um, some of the captures of the 2023 season. So as mentioned, grass carp are not established or reproducing in Canadian waters. However, there have been rare captures um, of grass carp in Canadian waters. So no reproducing populations, um, but the odd capture here and there in a couple of water bodies. So um, three, gas, three grass carp were captured in 2023, one in June, um, in the Grand River, one in July in the Bay of Quinte, and one in August in the Niagara River. Now what happens when these fish are captured? Um, a response plan gets triggered um, and DFO and MNRF may respond depending on the lab analysis. So they during lab analysis, they check for the sex and fertility of the fish. And then depending on that, they'll go and send out crews to check for more and limiting threat. And after those three uh, fish were captured this year, no more were found after monitoring. 
And what we do at the Invasive Species Center is we try to teach anglers and people out on the water how to identify and report grass carp. Um, and we have this grass carp ID and reporting guide available on asiacarp.ca. Um, and you can also find uh, a full map of Canadian grass carp captures also on asiancarp.ca with all their information on there as well. I'm going to give a really quick marbled crayfish update. Um, so marbled crayfish were are um, attractive in the aquarium trade due to their look. So you can see one right there. It's got marbled pattern and it's about a medium sized crayfish. Um, one thing to note about marbled crayfish is that they are pretty dangerous due to their reproductive abilities. So just one female um, can create an entire population on her own because um, they reproduce through cloning. So these fast growing um, and large clutch sizes will allow them to outcompete native crayfish species and introduce disease. Um, so the first wild record in North America was found this year in August in a uh, stormwater pond in Burlington. Um, and since then, MNRF and partners have been working to monitor this. And I'm not going to speak too much more on marbled crayfish because we do have a webinar on Monday um, all about marbled crayfish and this introduction. So um, if you're looking for more information on marbled crayfish, please tune into our webinar on Monday. Um, I will note, though, that is a, it is a prohibited species under the Invasive Species Act. And the invasive the province is actually undergoing revisions to the act, which is going to hopefully include um, other crayfish in the same family, which will help in any confusion or um, potential selling of crayfish that might be under a different name. Um, just quickly, here uh, is also a list of species that we're hoping to see on the new revisions of the Invasive Species Act. Um, nothing's set in stone yet, but if you were looking for an update. Um, you can go to the Environment Registry of Ontario website um, to have the official updates, which will hopefully be soon, but here's some that we're hoping to see on that list. And quickly, the boating pathway is also regulated. This is something worth noting. As of January 1st, 2022, not many people are aware that this is regulated um, under law. So regulations require you to clean and drain your boat. Um, so to clean your boat of any aquatic plants and to drain your boat of any water. Um, when traveling over land. So that's actually by law as of January 1st, 2022. Um, and we've heard about EDMAPS already, but if you think you've seen any invasive species, we always encourage to um, report to EDMAPS. And I'll very quickly plug a couple of our programs. Um, so we have the Invasive Species Action Fund, which is our granting program. Um, where you can apply to receive funding. We also have the Invasive uh, Phragmites invasive Control Fund um, providing um, grants for Phragmites control activities. So we're hoping to provide these in the new year, but you can register for updates on whether um, and when this may come available. So that's all available on our website along with more information. I'll take over here for the um, training program since I kind of helped run this program. Um, we do have a virtual training program that launched last year, which offers virtual self-paced courses to anyone wanting to further their learning in invasive species prevention and management. So we currently offer three forestry related courses, one on oak wilt, one on spotted lanternfly, and one forest pest training course that covers five different species. Um, all of these courses are registered with the International Society of Arbor Culture too. So if you're an eligible forestry professional, you can obtain continuing education units for completing these courses. Um, we do plan on releasing more courses next year. We already have some in development. So if you want to enroll or sign up for updates on when these courses become available, you can check out our website. And thanks so much. That's been our, our talk. Um, these are our emails here. So feel free to reach out at any time. We can also go through the Q&A and um, answer questions if we don't have time to get to them here. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. And you're basically on time. So we're good. That's good news. Um, so without any further ado, I will take a look at the Q&A and see where we're at. So I can, TD, by the way, is furiously answering questions from his session, which is very much appreciated. Uh, let's see now. First one I have on Oak Wilt is and this can either be Madison or Leanna, probably Madison. Uh, does oak wilt only attack mature trees or are young seedlings at risk also? Um, I think, well, it's a fungus, so it needs like 
you know, moisture to grow. So I think bigger trees are more susceptible. They're more likely to get it. But I think there have been cases of it also on smaller trees as well. Okay. Next one. Does oak wilt continue releasing spores when the tree is uh, dropped off? Sorry. Does oak wilt continue to release spores when the tree is dropped but left on the ground? I guess cut by dropped. <laughs> so if there are... Um those fungal mats and pressure pads, then yes, it is still a risk. So there are a couple different disposal methods that are outlined by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Um, it's on the website. It's also linked on our website. Um, in the case of the city of Niagara Falls, for example, they chose a deep burial method. So when they chopped down all those dead trees, um, they couldn't just leave the wood on the property. They had to get rid of it. And so they actually dug a big hole in a landfill and then dumped all the wood there and covered it up. And, uh, and that's a good way to do it. So um, it could still, if you leave it out um, unwrapped or anything like that, it could still, um, you know, spread the fungus around. Okay. Um, well, here's a quick one. Has black oak been infected by oak wilt? Oak leaf wilt? I think so. I think so? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, here's an interesting one. Can DNA determine where the aphids come from, i.e. the Coburg discovery uh, coming from Niagara. That's a good question. Um, I, I, I wish I knew more about the eDNI side of things. Um, I think you can figure out through the eDNA um, testing where exactly everything came from. Um, so I'm not sure if you could pinpoint where exactly it came from in Ontario, but I know you could probably tell where it came from elsewhere. Okay, I have I have a note here that Olivia has some information on this. Do you have information on this, Olivia? Um, no, sorry, I don't. I was just simply flagging that we would answer this question live. Sorry okay. for the confusion. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Uh, let's see now. Let's see. Okay. So we have one white pine needle damage or disease has become a major problem in the U.S. Northeast although all of the white pine needle damage constituent fungal agents are believed to be native, is there any here, uh, are there any surveys for white pine needle damage planned? Any thoughts, Madison or? Yeah. Not from me, that might be a better question for CFIA. Okay, TD. I'm not aware of, of plans for uh, for the survey. That one. We, can, okay. we can look into it, but uh, no. Okay. Um, actually, here's one for Leanna, because it looks like it has, deals with carp and not trees. Uh, were grass carp introduced into irrigation ditches in Alberta? Um, good question. I think you might be thinking of goldfish, actually. Um, goldfish were found in a couple uh, the irrigation systems and stormwater ponds in Alberta. Um, and that was likely due to human release. So probably thinking of goldfish there as there's no uh, populations of grass carp in Canada. Okay. And any new information on nematode infections affecting beech trees on the north side of Lake Erie? That actually sounds more of a TD question than it does a, a uh, Madison question, but either one. No thoughts? Okay. No, I'm uh, sorry. I don't for have... me, sorry. Okay, no problem. No, that, that's fine. We don't know, we don't know. So I got another, uh, we, we do have a thank you for informative inform, uh, informative uh, presentation, which is well appreciated. And we'll try one more question. Um, uh, I collect acorns to grow trees for a friend. Can oak be trans, uh, can oak be, can oak wilt be transported in the acorn? Seems unlikely, but because acorns are so dry. No, it can't be spread through acorns. It can't be spread through the soil either. It needs to go through that tissue, okay. that plant tissue. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now proceed on to the next presentation. And the next, let's try that. Okay, so the next presentation we have on the list will be a description of research demonstrating why some black ash are resistant to uh, to uh, eastern sorry emerald ash borer mortality. And speaking to this is Ken Farr of Natural Resources Canada's 
uh, Canadian Forest Service. And just if you're wondering who Ken Farr is, for those who don't know Ken, I do because I've, been, I've worked with him for many years, but many people haven't. But anyway, so Ken is a dendrologist and he is the manager of science integration at the Canadian Forest Service Natural Resources Canada. He was assistant professor of horticultural, urban forestry, and arboriculture at the Horticultural Department of Algonquin College. And he was an associate professor of dendrology at the University of Toronto School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture. He was a project dendrologist and is the scientific advisor for the reference text Trees of Trees in Canada by John Liard Farrar and is the author of the Canadian Forest Service publication, The Forest of Canada. Please join me in welcoming Ken Farr. Ah, thanks very much. I'm, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, there we go. <clears throat> and are, are you seeing the presentation? Yes, we are. Very good. Thanks very much. Well, thanks everyone for the opportunity to be here today and present some uh, interesting research into uh, a more, I think, uh, positive aspect of, of dealing with the emerald ash borer. I want to thank uh, particularly Dr. Uh, Natalie Isabel, who is a geneticist at the Laurentian Forest Center, genomicist, pardon me, Laurentian Forest Center, Canadian Forest Service, Natural Resources Canada, uh, who has uh, kindly provided this presentation to um, provide an overview of the uh, um, uh, uh, research that she's involved in. So a slightly different title, Pursuing Genetic Resistance to Emerald Ash Borer in Black Ash and Other Ash Species. Uh, it's a shared NSERC and Broad Alliance project. Um, and the focus of the research is first to mitigate impacts of alien pests introduced through international trade. Uh, it's also to document the genetic variation in black ash, uh, which is a culturally and uh, economically significant species. Um, it demonstrates the utility of a tree-centered approach to addressing challenges of climate change and increasing pest introductions. And uh, the, the ultimate outcome is to develop black ash and other ash species that are naturally resistant to emerald ash borer while preserving their adaptation to changing environments. So uh, the question becomes, is there a eureka moment uh, when one uh, considers the possibility of resistance in uh, black ash to uh, emerald ash borer? And uh, that's something we'll consider. <clears throat> And let's see if we can change screen. There we go. So um, we know quite well and, and was well presented in the, the previous presentations that the emerald ash borer is uh, widely spread in devastating ash trees across North America um, and uh, um, basically present in five provinces in 36 states, possibly six provinces based on what was uh, presented earlier and uh, some 8 billion North American ash uh, trees individually are at risk and uh, we certainly understand uh, the ash species are important in forest ecosystems. They they have, uh, from an ind indigenous cultural uh, perspective, connections and uh, important uh, utilization uh, aspects, and uh, in urban forests as well. Um, uh, ash has become or was uh, one of the most uh, prevalent trees, possibly too prevalent, um, as, as a kind of replacement to uh, elm trees. So here we see um, a kind of North American full shot of the uh, current um, uh, distribution of emerald ash borer, and it's overlaid over a, a cumulative map of the range of uh, the ash species in North America, about 16 different species, depending on how you uh, wish to, to uh, split them up taxonomically. Um, and uh, in the east, we have five uh, um, ash species, uh, which you can see the fruit thereof, the, uh, the Samaras, 
um, with uh, um, Black Ash second from the right. Uh, Black Ash and is is a widely distributed um, species in Canada as well as in the United States, and for that reason, it's become uh, a focus for the Canadian uh, content of this research. Um, I just note that um, it would be interesting to find out with respect to pumpkin ash and to blue ash, which have extremely limited distributions in Canada as to what their status is at the moment. But ultimately, all 16 of the North American species uh, are, are at risk. So this is a, a photo from uh, from the Can Canadian Broadcasting Association, uh, um, with uh, uh, showing the one of the cultural connections of uh, black ash within indigenous communities, um, and and it's a long-standing uh, historical cultural connection. Um, the uh, um, <clears throat> The the Askwasasni uh, community with whom um, we've been been uh, connecting uh, has noted that they are looking for ways to be resilient and of being selective in how they harvest black ash for basket making at this time. They're exploring different methods that others are using to preserve and replant ash species. Uh, they're following the research in other uh, universities, colleges, and groups, and individual researchers and. And uh, extremely significantly, they're monitoring stands that have received uh, triazine vaccines, hormone traps, and uh, other um, um, cultural uh, controls. And I just note that um, we tend to focus on black ash uh, baskets as being a cultural connection. But of course, the, the connection is much broader than that. And uh, tree species within the forest uh, go beyond uh, one commodity, similarly to the fact that white ash is the um, is the 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 the, the, the white ash uh, furnishes the wood for baseball bats in in uh, in the United States, and uh, as well, green ash is used by the Fender Guitar Company to make electric solid body guitars. But the cultural connections and this the uh, ecological connections go much further than that. So, how to save ashes? Um, the available treatments that have been uh, pursued, um, chemical trunk injections, biocontrols, uh, two different species of, of predatory wasps, um, uh, remain unproven. They have potential, but it's taken a long time for them to um, uh, manifest a, a kind of a, a response. Um, and traditionally, pest outbreaks you know, have been managed through eradication and containment measures against the pests themselves, um, but they're only effective in uh, early stages. And very often, uh, there's little or no genetic resistance that's observed uh, in, in forest trees uh, in North America, uh, particularly. So um, basically, uh, it, the, the idea of tree-centric uh, resistance is, is not pursued. And then identification and enhancement of observed resistance, uh, which is essentially tree breeding, for those of us of a certain age who remember such programs, uh, requires long-term support uh, into research uh, tree improvement, deployment, and sustained management commitments. So how to use, uh, how to save ashes. Uh, the para uh, paradigm shift that's proposed is to use nat natural genetic diversity to increase tree resistance. Um, and it's a shift because um, despite the need for trees resistant to pests and pathogens, Research in the area is rarely pursued, uh, the result of inherent challenges in tree resistance research. Some are biological, some are social. Uh, for instance, trees have long generation times, grow to large sizes, and they can't be put through uh, multiple rounds of experimental crossing in the lifetime of a typical researcher or a res research grant. Um, there is a perception of the likelihood of su success in tree resistance research uh, having uh, largely been a failure, um, kind of looking at the experience of Dutch elm disease and chestnut blight, where results have not been um, as, as successful as been hoped. Um, 
And then there are un unrealistic goals have been set in the view that the only acceptable level of resistance to a newly emerged tree pest or pathogen would be complete resistance. And in the case of a, um, a horticultural tree on, on a front lawn, complete resistance is desirable. Uh, in in the, the case of re, re uh, uh, rebuilding the forest and, and reintroducing ash species, including black ash, uh, partial resistance is is probably enough to at least um, uh, attain a long term uh, um, future for the species themselves. So uh, the slides here are interesting. The one is a shot of a, a canopy where um, emerald ash borer has uh, um, taken hold. You can see that there's lots of other green trees in there, uh, possibly different species, possibly resistant ash, um, something for uh, remote sensing to, to work on in future. And the slide on the right shows two um, ash trees in the same urban planting. Uh, the photos were taken by Dr. Uh, um, Isabel. They don't necessarily show resistance, but it's interesting that on one site, two trees planted side by side show uh, ex you know, varying uh, response to emerald ash infestation. So the concept of, of working on tree-centric research and developing resistance in, in tree species, particularly ash, has captured the imagination of reviewers. So there is a, a growing body of, of um, uh, research reports in, in the literature that talks about the idea. Um, it uh, does open up some interesting um, opportunities for, uh, for research. Um, the awareness certainly has raised the level of citizen science, and uh, it, it's really important to be able to monitor and identify the first possibly um, resistant uh, ash species that, that manifest themselves in an infected, uh, infested area. Um, and there are several ways to go about that now. It certainly allows scientists to work at a larger scale and work within the um, uh, uh, restrictions of, of available funding. Uh, a really good example for in the United States is, is a, um, an app called Tree Snap that is a, a smartphone app. You take a picture of a tree that's of interest uh, with regard to um, possible uh, resistance, and it, it immediately registers your your location and uh, an image of the tree. So there are new opportunities coming about for sure. As far as the the development of the concept of of um, uh, uh, resistance, breeding for resistance. Uh, this is the person who's who's first uh, kind of started this work in 2005, uh, Dr. Um, um, uh, Dr. Jennifer um, Koch, who works for the U.S. Forest Service at their lab in Delaware, Ohio. Um, since 2005, she and and her associates have been identifying surviving trees in 150 research plots. Um, thereafter, uh, they began grafting potentially resistant trees, uh, i.e. those that are uh, slower to die, uh, and, and they're uh, typified as lingering ash. So um, that was kind of a starting point for, for um, working on resistance. Uh, from there, the uh, uh, Dr. Koch and, and her associates developed a bioassay that uh, really um, directly involves injecting uh, emerald ash borer seeds into uh, putatively resistant trees. Um, and then after several months, inspect the trees, look at the size of the galleries of the larvae that have developed, uh, what's the percentage of, of dying or dead larvae, and what is the weight of the insects themselves. So um, through this work, uh, Jennifer's team have been able to detect, detect a variation in the degree of resistance between different individuals of Fraxinus pennsylvanica green ash. So the graph on the right is, is, is quite significant. These are varying uh, selections of, of possibly resistant green ash. And you can see that there is uh, considerable variation within the species itself. So the next step is then to um, uh, uh, 
to to outplant uh, possible um, resistant trees from making cuttings, and then uh, once the trees flower, you you then can can start a, um, a control cross program. And so the 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 uh, photo on the right shows uh, an orchard with controlled ash crosses. Um, it's slow tedious work, um, but it, it requires uh, long-term tracking of the possible resistance there is. <clears throat> so here's a, a, another interesting approach. This is a, a graph of um, varying inter, interspecific um, uh, resistance in ash species. So at the top left, which is um, a higher level of uh, survival when tested uh, with bioassays, uh, Fraxis manchurica, uh, manchurican ash, um, which evolved with the emerald ash borer in situ, shows a very high level of resistance as we'd expect. Uh, on the far end of the scale, black ash, Fraxinus nigra, um, is shows very little resistance, which makes sense. But if you look at the cladogram on the right of, of the evolution of ash species over time since the Miocene, some 20 million years ago, you'll see that uh, in fact, uh, Fraxinus manchurica and Fraxinus nigra are very closely related and share a, a, a previous um, um, uh, contact. So uh, it really speaks to the fact that uh, evolution in situ with the uh, with the the pest itself is very important to develop genetic resistance. So, how did the uh, project itself um, uh, evolve? Um, it, it began with discussions between uh, the Canadian Forest Service and the U.S. Forest Service and um, uh, relevant universities as well in both countries. Um, and it's yeah, kind of typified here, which is which I think is quite interesting, is uh, society resistance, resilience as well. And it's kind of as we've seen throughout the presentation that um, uh, there is uh, these invasive pest uh, uh, issues uh, are don't stop at the border. They're shared. So. So the uh, first um, uh, approach was to have high-level discussions of a, of a program that took place in 2018 in Washington, D.C. And in 2019, the Canadian Forest Service um, team visited uh, Delaware, Ohio, and Jennifer's uh, Koch's lab to look at the work that was going on and to develop uh, a plan. So um, the idea really was to come up with a long-term plan that includes uh, all of the steps needed to uh, uh, establish a re resilient tree system. And uh, it takes about five years to develop um, uh, uh, predative um, uh, resilient species, and then 10 years to develop an operational approach, considering that um, you, know, you, you also, beyond developing the trees, then have to come up with means to propagate them uh, through tree breeding and to um, uh, deploy them as well in the landscape. So it's extremely um, uh, complex and, and requiring of, of um, control and inputs uh, to, to develop a process such as this. So um, at that point, if, as you note the date, well, then came COVID. And uh, since that time, uh, wildfires in Canada have been a major concern. And uh, there's been a bit of a, a change in, in the um, uh, alignment, if you will, in the program. Uh, so at this point, uh, the collaboration with the U.S. Forest Service and universities continues. Uh, the Canadian lead for the, the uh, research is now Yann Sergit Groba at the University of Quebec uh, in uh, Ontario. So uh, two objectives to, to uh, develop this work and, and bring it forward. One is to monitor the situation pre and post um, EAB uh, infestation. And uh, the purpose there is to give you some idea of, of how uh, infestations develop and then tail off. And uh, more importantly, to be able to identify slower to die trees. So uh, how do you do that? Establish long-term monitoring plots and follow their progress and the progress of putatively resistant trees over time. The second objective uh, is to um, study the adaptive genetic diversity of, um, of uh, uh, 
ash trees, black ash included, understanding that the genetic diversity is really where it's the raw material of, of evolution where, where resistance is going to be found. So where are we at at this point? Um, <clears throat> In terms of objective two, the map on the top shows the the um, collections and research studies that have been done up to this time. Uh, so this represents a wide scale collection of DNA material and uh, and seeds from black ash uh, plots across eastern Canada and as far west as as eastern Manitoba. Um, the idea here, of course, is that um, genomic wide association mapping will give you uh, a very detailed uh, idea of where putatively um, active genes for resistance can be found in the genome of the species itself. Um, and one of the outcomes of, of this work is to uh, think about um, where and how far resistant trees can be moved when they're introduced back into the landscape because because, um, of course, they, each genotype is, is specifically uh, adapted to, to the place where it, where it occurs um, through, through uh, adaptive uh, variation. So um, this is a map of, of the current capacity and the current uh, act, active uh, research partners within the, uh, the pr uh, project. So we have three uh, Canadian Forest Service um, um, forestry centers, Atlantic Forest Center, um, uh, the Laurentian Forest Center, and the Great Lakes Forest Center, uh, as well as the um, the U.S. Forest Service uh, Center in Delaware, Ohio, where work on white ash is ongoing, um, and uh, a, a couple of U.S. Uh, universities that are involved. Uh, one of the involvement is development of very large-scale data systems that are required, databases that are required for dealing with the huge amount of, of information that needs to be modeled through this, this work. Uh, and note that out in uh, um, the western U.S. in, in in uh, Oregon, uh, there is U.S. Forest Service work going on on Western species of, of ash, which are also at risk. Um, so uh, here are the partners involved in the uh, in the project. Um, and you'll note that um, there are, are partners uh, from the private sector, from uh, the, the Canadian government, from U.S. universe. This is the Canadian. Uh, has Ken frozen up or? Yeah, yeah, just one one more slide to go. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so this is just where are we now? Uh, this is where um, uh, samples have been taken for varying uh, uh, ash species to develop the genomics. And as a backup plan, uh, there are uh, black ash uh, seed collections as well, uh, as it takes a long time to build up uh, a seed base. So this is work being done at the uh, Canada Seed uh, um, Center in Atlantic Canada. Finally, here's here's a, a list of, of the um, uh, participants uh, um, across Canada and the United States. And I'd like to uh, again thank uh, Dr. Uh, Isabel for making this uh, uh, re presentation possible. And as far as the question of is there a, a eureka moment in um, development of resistance in, in tree species to pests, I say the eureka moment is when the uh, um, idea comes along that it's actually possible to do so. So thanks very much for the presentation, for the, uh, allowing the presentation and uh, back to you, Joe. Thank you so much, Ken, that was great. Uh, so we have, uh, let me take a look at the uh, questions and see where we're at. If there's something that makes sense that, uh, that uh, is something that's directed towards the emerald ash borer. Uh, da, 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 damage. Okay, so let's see now. Just an FYI, suddenly, sadly, only twice did I drop 
did I prop up suckers of a dying ash tree and both suckers are now thriving and growing beautifully. Ironically, a third ash on my front yard that I fully expected to die and planted a tulip tree next to it, still living despite all the damage done to the bark. I wish that I would have propped up the dozens of ash trees sucked suckers. Okay, that's great. Uh, so the question is, curious to understand why suckers are still living and thriving and growing in beautiful into beautiful trees. Any thoughts, Ken? So uh, these are suckers that are living after the, the main stem of the tree has, has been, uh, eradicated the emerald ash borer. Um, um, uh, buds in in the trunk of, of the tree that that remained uh, alive um, um, and the name escapes me right now uh, you do get secondary coppicing from uh, the stumps of, of of killed trees it's actually a bit of a problem in that it represents another target for the uh, emerald ash borer so the the original idea was maybe there would be one wave of infestation and death and and uh, it would move on but if you're getting repeated suckering from affected ash trees it actually extends the time of the uh of the infestation okay adventitious buds pardon me okay good uh second question is blue ash still considered to be resistant to emerald ash borer that's a really good question. I had uh, I've read literature that that says blue ash is resistant, but not entirely. And in in areas where there's a very high level of infestation, it's kind of the last species to be uh, affected. Uh, kind of like Brussels sprouts, it's the last thing that people, or a lot of people, will eat on their plate if they don't really care for them. Uh, and again, I'd note that blue ash in Canada has an extremely limited distribution, much broader in the United States. So it's an issue in Canada. I think it's worth no looking to see if that species is still actually present in Canada. I could have noted that all five of the eastern uh, North American ash species have been listed uh, and uh, as uh, uh, critically endangered on the IUCN red list. Okay. Uh, I've got a couple of notes here thanking you for the presentation, which is very much appreciated. Uh, just two more questions. I realize that seed propagation will be much slower than grafting, but has any work been done with seeds? Well, seeds would be one ultimate outcome of a successful um, uh, research uh, and development program for resistant ash. Um, if, if they're seeds, then they've been pollinated. Um, if they're grown in a, a seed orchard with, with uh, all considered resistant trees, you have a very good chance of, of uh, continuing the resistance in the next generation. And as noted, it's probably better to have partially resistant trees where the resistance is driven by different genes within the, the each individual rather than, than having uh, a tree with one major gene that controls resistance, which was the case for uh, some of the, the research done with um, white pine blister rust, where that resistance can then be overcome by the pest itself. So right. yeah, some work is going on with, with seeds. It takes a little longer to get to that stage. Black ash, uh, for instance, it's about an eight-year cycle to get a really good crop of seeds. Okay. And last but not least, a press question from uh, another question. Great presentation, Ken. Does the genomics work include looking at markers in the genome that confers resistance? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a better question for Dr. Uh, Isabel than myself. But um, uh, yeah, the, a lot of the work that's being done is is actually through the new uh, CRISPR methodologies. Uh, it, it explains the uh, broad collection of, of leaf samples and seeds. Um, you, you need a broad sample to be able to look at those markers. And it speeds up the ability to understand where the resistant genes might lie. So it really takes um, a lot of the new uh, genetic um, techniques that are out there. But one of the papers I no read noted that at the end of the day, you're still doing tree breeding in the classical way to be able to propagate and deploy the trees. Okay, thank you very much. And now we go to our final presentation. So last but not absolutely not least, we have Robert Smith, who will give us a, dem a description of how invasive species of on our Southern border or his northern border, I guess, for that matter, are being managed opportunities for a partnership approach with the Eastern Ontario model, sorry, Eastern Ontario Forest Health Network. And if we're wondering who Robert Smith might be, and let me just uh, flip over to his uh, his bio, which is quite interesting. If nothing else, for the organization he works for, 
Uh, so Robert Olds, a bachelor, a bachelor and a master's of science from the State University of New York um, of environmental science and forestry with a focus on forest ecology as the terrestrial restoration and resiliency coordinator for the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake, Ontario uh, Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, better known as SLELO PRISM. I can't say that five times. He is responsible for the management of terrestrial invasive species, restoration of treatment sites, biocontrol releases, and an urban forest program. Please join me in welcoming Robert Smith. And you're on mute, Robert. Got it. All right, can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right. Good morning. Uh, Today, I'd like to uh, talk about the uh, forest uh, pests that Celo Prism is dealing with uh, south of your border. For those not overly familiar with Celo Prism, like was mentioned earlier, Celo Prism stands for St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario Partnership for Invasive Species Management. We are one of eight prisms that were established by the New York Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, each prism is managed by an uh, organization contracted by the DEC. Slilo prism, along with the Adirondack prism, are um, managed by the Nature Conservancy. So what do we do? Well, we, uh, we assist uh, with the uh, management of invasive species in five counties, those being Jefferson, St. Lawrence, Lewis, Oswego, and Oneida. This is done directly by us in uh, what we call priority conservation areas and indirectly by partnering with other organizations that manage for invasives on their land, as well as educating the public who uh, manage their private properties and report sightings of invasive species throughout the region. For this presentation, I will talk briefly about emerald ash borer, hemlock woolly adelgid, Elm, elm zigzag sawfly, and beech leaf disease, which are in the Silo Prism region, region. I will also talk about spotted, spotted lanternfly, which is uh, very close to the Silo Prism region. As most of you already know, EAB is an emerald colored wood boring beetle, which in the larval stage burrows tunnels and feeds on the cambium layers of all native ash trees. This feeding cuts off nutrient supply to the infested tree, eventually killing it. So far, it has killed tens of millions of, of ash trees. Emerald ash borer is currently known to be present in four out of the five Salulo Prism counties. Those are Jefferson, St. Lawrence, Oswego, and Oneida. It has not been found yet in Lewis County which you can see is kind of the western portion of that big gap on the map there of areas that are not, the area that's not blue where EAB has not detected. So basically near the Adirondack region. <clears throat> Our current management strategy is uh, <clears throat> an integrated management approach <clears throat> with uh, biocontrol being our, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> with biocontrol being our long-term strategy for forest management throughout the region. Uh, we do recommend chemical treatment uh, in urban areas or private properties for individual or small numbers of trees, which are of significance to the municipality or private landowner. Um, removal may also be necessary for untreated ash trees in municipalities or along streets where they uh, would become a safety hazard. I also want to briefly, since it was mentioned by Ken, or his whole presentation is basically about it, is uh, we, we also have a similar uh, kind of thing where um, we have monitoring plots for ash trees, uh, and we um, collaborate with the Ecological Research Institute. So we haven't gotten to the point where any of our those um, ash tree stands have uh, depleted down to the last few where they would be resistant ones. But the idea is the same as what Ken was talking about. We would then contact um, the Ecological Research Institute and um, those trees could be then um, used as part of a breeding program for um, 
EAB resistant ash trees. All right. Current biocontrol for EAB consists of three parasitoid wasps that are provided to us by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, these are Ubius agrilli, Spathius gallinae, and Tartasticus planipanisi. These uh, parasitoid wasps uh, reduce the population of EAB by targeting either the EAB eggs or the larvae. The uh, USDA has several uh, different um, release methods depending on the life stage of the parasitoid uh, wasps and the species. These are the ubinator, which is for Ubius agrilli pupae, an ash bolt for Tetrasticus planipanisi or Spathius gallinae pupae, and um, a cup there for adults for all species. So far, there are eight sites in Celoprism where these wasps have been released. Releases have occurred since uh, 2019 by state and nonprofit organizations. Um, I would like to talk briefly about one of these sites, SUNY Oswego, where uh, Celoprism released EAB biocontrol in 2022 and 2023. Uh, this year was our second year participating in the USDA's uh, EAB biocontrol release program at Rice Creek Field Station at SUNY Oswego. Uh, this program involves a two-year release of the three species of paratoy wasps and a biocontrol establishment survey that is con uh, conducted at least a year after the last release of the wasps, which for this site will be uh, 2025. The um, this uh, establishment survey method will most likely involve using yellow pan traps. Uh, total parasitoid wasps by species released at this site were uh, 2,347 Spathius gallinae, 5,652 Tetrasticus planipanisi, and 2,200 Ubius gallinae. That is a grand total of 10,199 EAB biocontrol insects that were released at this site. Uh, other release sites that I mentioned, uh, Insulaprism, release similar numbers as part of the USDA's uh, EAB biocontrol release program. All right, uh, the parasitoid wasps are shipped to us overnight delivery from the USDA Rearing Lab in Michigan. Upon receipt, uh, I um, transport them to the release site. At the release site, I will meet up with one or more of our participating organizations. We will then disperse them to different sections um, of the release area on each release day. The uh, area and information about which species and life stage were released along with information about the trees that I, atta that I attached the bolts or ubinators to is uh, recorded in the USDA's biocontrol app. All right, next I would like to talk a little bit about about um, hemlock woolly adelgid, or HWA. Hemlock woolly adelgid is a small aphid-like uh, insect, about one and a half millimeters in length, uh, brown or black in color. They feed on hemlock sap at the base of the needles. In uh, late fall, early winter, they'll form a white woolly mass that um, makes them really easy to spot. Uh, trees will gradually decline with this feeding with symptoms that include a lack of uh, bright green foliage, needle loss, and uh, or graying needles and thinning foliage. HWA is only known to be present in the uh, Salila region in Oswego County. Since finding the first HWA site in 2021 at Oswego County reforestation area, Sligo Prism and the uh, New York State Park staff have found uh, seven sites with HWA in Oswego County. Uh, these uh, sites, as you can see on the map, uh, they're, they're mostly located along the Lake Ontario shoreline. Uh, we don't know for sure, but we do suspect that um, my, the bird migration along the lake shore and perhaps the, um, the warmer weather that occurs directly next to the lake uh, is um, assisting 
the uh, HWA and its movement north along the shoreline. Like with EAB, our current management strategy is an integrated management approach with uh, biocontrol being our long-term strategy for forest management throughout the region. Chemical treatment may be used in urban areas or private properties for individual or small numbers of trees, which are significance. Uh, chemical treatment may also be used at biocontrol re uh, release sites. Uh, this involves a, uh, our spatial and timing considerations but it has been found to be a good way to maintain forest health while the biocontrol insects are establishing themselves. Uh, removal, uh, like with EAB, may also be necessary for untreated hemlock trees in municipalities or along streets where they would uh, become a safety hazard. Current biocontrol for HWA consists of two Laracobius beetles and two uh, Leucotaraxis silverflies. The uh, uh, silverflies feed on the first of two generations of HWA produced annually, while the uh, Leucotaraxis silverflies feed on the second generation of HWA. The uh, New York Hemlock Initiative uh, collects uh, the Laracobius nigrinus and the silverflies from the Pacific Northwest. So far, um, biocontrol releases have occurred at four of the seven sites. Lyricobius nigrinus has been released at Mexico Point State Park and Independence Park. Lyricobius osakensis, which was provided uh, by uh, collaborators at Virginia Tech uh, recently, was uh, released at Battle Island State Park. And uh, Leucotaraxis pinaperta was uh, released at Selkirk Shores State Park. Uh, numbers of each can be seen on the slide, and the grand total is 5,826 HWA biocontrolled insects um, that have been released in the Slow Prism uh, area. Uh, there will also be an additional 500 Laracobius nigrinus beetles released at uh, Independence Park uh, this Friday, which will move our numbers up to 2,000 beetles released at Independence Park and a grand total that'll go over 6,000 uh, total for HWA biocontrol in the Salilo Prism region. Uh, Salilo Prism uh, conducts HWA surveys each winter since HWA produces a white woolly mass around themselves during this time of year, so it makes them really easy to spot. This year, we selected 14 sites, which you can see on the slide, to survey, um, most of these uh, sites are uh, located just outside of the known HWA sites. Volunteer opportunities led by our education outreach coordinator will also uh, be available at four sites, which are also listed on the slide. Next, I'd like to talk briefly about Elm Zigzag Sawfly. It's a new arrival to the Salilo Prism area. Uh, it was found in St. Lawrence County in 2022. So far, we have not seen it in any other county. Uh, for those not familiar with Elmsville, Elm Zigzag Sawfly, it's a, in, in its larval form, it's light green with a black band on its head and T-shaped markings above the second and third pair of two legs. Adults are uh, black with yellow, white colored legs and smoky brown colored wings. Uh, cocoons are loosely spun and net-like and are found attached to uh, leaves and other objects. Young larvae uh, feed on elm leaves in a distinct zigzag pattern, which is where it gets its name. Older larvae feed more broadly, leaving only leaf veins. Uh, they can uh, cause significant defoliation, branch dieback, and uh, crown thinning, but have not yet been shown to cause tree mortality. They can, however, make trees more vulnerable to other tree pests and pathogens. Uh, prevention and early detection are considered to be the best controlled methods at this time. Uh, Salilo Prism is collaborating with partners to implement an outreach strategy to enhance early detection and awareness of the uh, Elm Zigzag Sawfly. Uh, we've co-hosted a webinar with the New York DEC and uh, New York's uh, Department of Agriculture and Markets to train and recruit volunteers to assist with these early detection efforts. Um, 
you know, efforts, including reporting to um, IMAP invasives, which is a um, invasive species uh, database uh, that the uh, New York Natural Heritage Program uses. We also have a species page uh, for the sawfly on our website, which has a sign up form um, uh, to volunteer to assist early detection efforts. Uh, trail surveys are also being planned and a list of potential sites can be seen on the slide. Beech leaf disease is another uh, new forest pest to arrive in the Silo Prism region. It was found in Oswego County in 2022 and so far we have not found it in any of our other counties. Beech leaf disease is caused by a uh, nematode, um, perhaps in association with a fungus or bacteria, but that's still unknown. Uh, symptoms include uh, darkened uh, striping between the veins of the leaves, heavily banded, shrunken, browning, yellowing, or uh, crinkled, thick, leathery texture on leaves with severe symptoms, reduced leaf and bud production, leaf loss and uh, dead buds on heavily infested, infected tr trees, and um, heavily infected and unaffected branches uh, also can be seen on the same tree. Uh, the uh, beech leaf disease uh, can kill mature uh, beech trees in seven years and smaller year or smaller beaches in as little as two or three years. And all species of beaches are um, affected. Like Elm zigzag sawfly, uh, prevention and early detection are considered to be the best control methods at this time. This includes uh, webinars on identification of uh, beech leaf disease and how to report to IMAP invasives. Uh, field survey training like the one conducted last year at Joseph A. Blake Wildlife uh, Sanctuary and inclusion in Slulo Prism's uh, Pledge to Protect program, which uh, provides information activities that people can use to protect their favorite hiking trails, paddleways, forests, gardens, and communities uh, from invasive species. Uh, the last pest I'd like to talk about today is spotter lanternfly. So far, no infestations of spotter lanternfly has been found in the Oswego Prism region. A dead spotter lanternfly has been found in Oswego County at the southern edge of our region. You can see a little red point that, on the map that indicates that. Uh, just to our south, um, in Onondaga, Broome, Tompkins, and Tioga County, uh, known infestations of spider lanternfly have been found. So it's super close to our area and moving in quick. <clears throat> For those not overly familiar with spider lanternfly, it is a plant hopper. The early stage uh, nymphs are black with white spots. White late, uh, light, white late stage uh, nymphs turn red with white spots. Uh, adults are approximately an inch long by half inch wide. Uh, they're, uh, they have grayish colored forewings, red hind wings with black spots, and upper wing portions that are dark with wet, white stripes. Spider lanternfly uses their mouth parts to feed on the sap of more than 70 plant species, including apple and maple trees, hops and grapes, and they, are often, they often feed in large numbers. They, uh, prefer, their preferred host tree is Tree of Heaven, which is also an invasive species. Uh, spider lanternfly makes the trees more vulnerable to um, disease and other insects. Um, and it uh, excretes large amounts of sticky honeydew, uh, which promotes a buildup of sooty mold on infested trees. Just with, with elm zigzag sawfly and beech leaf disease, focus with spider lanternfly management is prevention and early detection. Uh, Slilo Prism and our partners are providing webinar training on how to identify SLF, inspect equipment and gear if visiting areas with, uh, with spider lanternfly, inspecting preferred um, spider lanternfly trees for egg masses, and reporting that uh, spider lanternfly if found. We have also set up uh, spider lanternfly traps at high risk areas. <clears throat> One example of our increased education outreach for spider lanternfly is our SLF spotters program. This program engages uh, local uh, businesses to distribute SLF brochures to their customers, 
The brochures have a QR code, a link to an online survey that collects information on whether the recipient of the brochure was traveling from outside of New York State, if they've uh, heard of SLF be uh, before the brochure, getting the brochure, and if they uh, would agree to check their vehicles and equipment for SLF prior to traveling and report and to uh, report sightings. <clears throat> At this time, we have 21 participating businesses, including marinas, bait and tackle uh, shops, <clears throat> and uh, wineries with the Silo region uh, near that are nearby uh, tourist hotspots. And uh, most businesses have reported that more than half <clears throat> of their uh, customers are from out of state. Um, our education outreach coordinator, Megan Pistolais, uh, also visits fishing hotspots along the Salmon River to directly engage anglers, many who have traveled from known SLF quarantine areas. The anglers seem to already uh, know about SLF, and fortunately, they're happy to, they're happy to uh, check their vehicles and report sightings. Um, starting in 2022, Silo Prism, in partnership with New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets, started setting up SLF traps at boat launches throughout the Silo region. These were uh, checked every two weeks from June through October by the boat launch stewards, who are on site to uh, check boats going in and out of the water bodies and provide information about um, invasive species. So far, they have not found any in the traps, which is great. All right, that ends my presentation. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, do you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. That's great. Uh, it turns out there are a few questions here. Let oh, me just take great. a look at that. We're also getting, we're, we're coming up against time here too. Yes. Uh, so uh, two, I currently have two questions. One is, are any biocontrol methods being reviewed for approval for use in Canada for hem uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, and I'm not sure. Can, can you answer that, or maybe uh, somebody else is in a better place to answer that? Yeah, I think somebody else is going to be a better place on that one. Yeah. Uh, TD or possibly Jim, maybe if he's available to answer that. I'm not sure where we are in the in the approval, but yeah, there's research going on right now, and I just sent in the Q and A uh, an article that the CBC published recently, so. Uh, it's definitely uh, in the works. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the last question, has there been any consideration given to using beech leaf disease as a biological herbicide control uh, to control beech regeneration in the aftermath forests of beech bark disease? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I mean, beech bark disease has been a very big problem for a lot of foresters because of the um, the sprouts uh, affecting the regeneration of uh, trees that they're uh, they're that they planted to uh, you know to harvest at some point in time. But no, I haven't heard anything about that. Okay, and finally, are any biocontrols being used for spotted lanternfly? Not at this time, but that would be awesome when it does. <laughs> okay, well, seeing how we are coming right on time, and 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 th so first of all, thank you very much to all our presenters for basically providing us, not basically, for giving us very interesting presentations, very good information, and you know, as far as I'm concerned, pretty well keeping to time. So that was very much appreciated, and uh, this has been great. Um, thank you so much. Any, any final words from anybody else? Okay, well, I think we're good to go. John, you can shut her down. Thank you very much. Happy holidays to all concerned, and that's great. And hopefully we'll see you somewhere along the line. Thanks for the great moderation, Joe. Oh, no problem. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.